Adam Darkins. I'm the Vice President of um, Innovation and Strategic Partnerships at Medtronic in the USA. As you may be able to tell from my accent, I originally come from the UK. I trained and worked as a neurosurgeon. I became involved in telemedicine and telehealth because one of the things I found is that as a specialist physician, it was very important that I was technically competent. And we're here with a patient safety con uh, conference, tremendously important. But if you get the wrong patient to the operation or the treatment, no matter how good you do it technically, you end up not being able to have good outcomes. So I got involved in telemedicine about how you take decisions to the patient. If you want the patient to have the right place, the right care in the right place at the right time, you have to make the right decision to get them there. So I'm very excited about what telemedicine, telehealth is going to do for healthcare and how it will transform it. Um, so it's an honor to be here today and to share some of my thoughts with you all. I had the privilege yesterday of going to Apollo Hospitals and to see the work that's being done in telemedicine, telehealth there, which is very impressive. I think that where hospitals in the USA and um, more advanced hospitals in other countries are going is to deconstruct our healthcare systems and technology is going to help us do that. I see what you're going to be doing is building a new healthcare system from the bottom. So we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. So I think there's a lot that we will be learning from yourselves, so I'm very excited to be here. So I just wanted to give you a brief historical perspective. For those involved in telemedicine, telehealth, it may be somewhat new. In the US, it's been around for 50 years. In 1963, um, Michael DeBakey, a very famous heart surgeon, broadcast a heart, open heart surgery abroad to France. And also, William Byrd, an internist in Boston, provided services from Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard, across to Logan Airport. At the same time, in those early 60s, the advanced projects, uh, sorry, advanced, sorry, the advanced research projects agency in the USA put four computers together to create the start of what became the internet. Just briefly going through, you can see how we've been through e-health, m-health, connected care, and we go onward in virtual care. At that same time, the internet went forward to the computer services network, public internet, e-commerce, streaming video, video media, social media, and we have the internet of things coming. The market for e-commerce is $3 trillion by 2020. The market for telehealth, telemedicine is forecast to be $6 billion. Now, I think why I point that out is the internet has been very much based on the person, on people, on the consumer. Healthcare and telemedicine has taken a path more around the provider and the physician. So I think the really exciting thing we're now moving towards is how personalized medicine, as we heard earlier, how the connection with the patient is where this is going to go. So I'm going to share with you some experience I had. I spent 14 years working for the US federal government for the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I built a very large telehealth, telemedicine network. So I'd like to share with you some of the experiences of that, to give you some sense of where telemedicine, telehealth can go. I give the reference for the work which I did. And this work involved serving a population of 6.5 million people, predominantly male, because this was veterans who'd been in the US military. Now, the primary reason for developing the programs wasn't to develop a technology program. It was challenges with access, cost, and quality of delivering care. So I implemented a program in 152 hospitals, over 600 other sites of care, largely primary care clinics. The services developed covered 44 different clinical specialties, including tele-ICU. And often they involved uh, shortage specialties providing services to places where it was difficult to recruit physicians. There were three main modalities of telehealth that they were based on. One was delivering care into people's own homes, and the services built to manage 150,000 patients went through the services a year, and at any one time, 95,000 patients receiving remote care in their own homes for chronic disease, diabetes, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, etc and also mental health conditions. 
that was store and forward telehealth that was mainly aimed at doing retinal imaging for diabetic eye disease and doing dermatology. And there was video conferencing between hospitals and clinics and directly into people's own homes. Again, it is patient need that drove the development of these services. The video conferencing services were largely based initially on developing telemental tele health programs, but also rehabilitation and covered surgery and, as I said, 44 different specialties. The services were built not from grant money that came from above, but essentially from efficiencies in delivering care that created sustainable revenue. And so this led to a 2,000-fold 2000 increase, 2000 increase in the programs from when I started in 1999 to when I left in 2014. And there were 760,000 patients who were getting care a year in the programs and 2.2 million consultations per year. This was a very large network of delivery of care and these were not pilots that would go down. Essentially, the service has been refigured, reconfigured. So without these services, there would be gaps in patient care. So there was no question about their worth or sustainability. So I wanted to share, as you're thinking about developing telehealth, e-health programs, that this didn't happen by accident, it happened by design. When I arrived in the organization, there were many pilot programs Pilot programs that be grant-funded come up, go down, come up, and go down. And so I set off to say, this is really about developing a network, and it's also about learning, standing on the shoulders of what's been done before. So it doesn't start with the, whole, with the technology, it started with the population health need that I've said before. And networks are built on high-volume, low-cost applications. So it's very interesting to do services to support liver transplantation, their high cost services and infrequent. So often it's primary care and the primary secondary care interface where one builds these. It's important to set out to solve challenges that affect patients. And I think of telemedicine, telehealth, e-health in the context of being largely a multimedia patient record. You need the electronic health record. So think of it as being using these other modalities as being a multimedia record. Health systems, money follows patients. So if you ensure you provide services to patients, the money follows. And it's necessary to standardize the clinical, the technology, and the business processes to make this happen. Often in pilots and programs, these start off as relationships. Somebody knows somebody who can do that. You can't replicate relationships across 152 hospitals. So this is about creating sustainable process. And there's quite a large investment in time to do that. And that overhead makes sense to do it on a large network. And there's a saying in Britain around Christmas time, where I come from, which says a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. So I kind of used that in developing telemedicine and telehealth. If you're doing it, it's for life, not for Christmas. You're not going to develop a large teleradiology program and then after five years say, hey, that was fun. Let's recreate the films. Let's recreate those storage rooms. So when you think how many of these programs are designed, they're not designed with the kind of tolerances and care that means they're going to survive. So I just wanted to quickly go through, and you'll have these as notes. In order to do this, I had to develop these things myself. They were not out there to take on a shelf. Clinical models of care with clinical pathways. Clear accountability for the technology, the clinical services, and the business processes. With associated processes for governance. So in a hospital, how does the services relate to the CEO? How does it relate to the CIO? How do you get those services recognized funded and to be able to do things. Training of staff. The initial person who's an enthusiast leaves and your programs collapse. So services need to have staff trained. I built virtual training centers, three of them for the three modalities, 
and trained 5,000 people per year, 90% of that training being done virtually. Quality management with metrics. We're building new services. They don't need to be variable like the rest of healthcare. We can do it in the way it should be for the future. I developed an accreditation program that matched the Joint Commission accreditation. The Joint Commission does not yet, as far as I know, and certainly didn't then accredit it, so we mirrored it. Privacy and cybersecurity, help desk support, risk management, and continuity of operations. You have to know what would happen if your system went down. And the mark of a program's survival is very often to ask, what would you do if the program failed? If somebody says to you, well, we do what we always did, what they're basically saying is they're double running a system in the background. They're not making any cost savings. You have to change how staff deliver care. If you do that, that system has to be reliable. It's for life, not just for Christmas, as I said. Coding of activity, measurement of clinical technology and business-related outcomes. And remember, you have to keep doing ongoing development. Otherwise, you become your own legacy system and you fail. So, just quickly to go through, these are things for you to think about. I could go in much greater detail. It is really important to develop the evidence. Again, I don't have time to go through in detail, but we have to find new ways to assemble that evidence in a rapidly changing environment. Clinical technology, social science, and policy considerations all need to be thought of, as opposed sometimes to these little silos. There's lack of evidence for the legacy systems we're replacing. And is the future of what we're talking about, are you investing in what you're doing around making incremental changes in care as it currently is? Or do you believe, as I do, we're going to fundamentally transform healthcare? So it needs a clear vision for the future and not a nostalgia for the past. And that includes doing research. So, those are the things I'd like to share with you. These were the things that were necessary to actually build out and design and make a network that was big, reliable, and delivers care. As I finish, and I've got a couple of moments left, I'd like to just say to you that we've been here before. When the telephone was introduced, exactly the same issues were raised when the telephone was used in healthcare. It's now used widely, and we wouldn't believe of delivering healthcare without the telephone. All the technologies we're talking about, video and information technologies, will all happen. So the question is not whether it's going to happen, it's how it's going to happen. So I like to share sometimes a little story. When I was a medical student, I spent a summer going to Ireland, to the south of Ireland, and I worked in Cork. I arrived there on a Sunday, and on the Monday morning, I did rounds with the professor of surgery, who'd just come back from doing a lecture tour in the USA. Never met him before. We went and did rounds. And then in those more, um, if you'd like, civilized times in healthcare, where there was more time, we sat down, we had coffee at the end of the rounds. And he was talking to me, he said, you might not have noticed, but as I went round, I touched every patient. So what he did is he might have just patted them on the back, shaked their hands, held their ankle for a moment. He washed his hands, so there was no issue with spread of infection. He said to me something that nobody else ever said again in my medical training, which stuck with me for the rest of my days. He said, it is important, vitally, if you're going to deliver care, that you touch the patient. So I'd like to leave with you this thought. This is all going to happen. How it's done from clinical pathways, how it's done from the technology, all the things I've said are tremendously important. This is not around physicians, it's not around nurses. This is about a, a team working also with technologists. The network engineer is as important as the cardiologist in delivering care. So this is something where, remember, you need to touch the patient. So as I finish, I'd just like to finish with this. Where is this going next? In the US, the Center for Medicare and Medis Medicaid Services is bringing in telehealth 
into its new value-based insurance design. I've moved from working in the pri public sector to working in the private sector and just wanted to share some insights from Omar Ishraq, a very, very um, forward-thinking CEO in the organization I work for. And in sponsoring a collaboration between the Harvard Business Review and the New England Journal of Medicine, he said, today in our service-based systems, we pay for each step in patient care regardless of outcome. However, it's become increasingly clear that we must collaborate to shift this to a model of care that focuses on rewarding patient outcomes. So please touch the patient, and I think the future of this is not old reimbursement systems, but how we provide value to care. Thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>